to you all. Howdy. Hello, everyone. I'm pretty sure Matt came in on the end there. Uh, totally, totally intended. Definitely not an issue. Um, where am I? What day is it? Cody, what, what kind of week have we had? Uh, it's been a bit busy. Um, we've been working very hard on development two on the V9 phase. Uh, we've been churning through all sorts of milestone weight while also keeping up on all the other things that Foundry needs to do in a week-to-week basis, including working with some of our wonderful creators, one of whom we have today with us. Um, the work never really ends, does it, Neff? I mean, yeah, there's that. Like, people people talk about the fact, you know, they, they get days off, and I'm like, what's that like? Um, I joke, of course. Obviously, I, I take some time on the weekends, just, you know, not today, obviously. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's it's been a constant push. We're really trying to get V9 Dev 2 out. It's, uh, it's been a big one. There's a lot of crazy stuff coming that people are going to be very surprised by. Um, I will say that for my part, this week was spent, uh, a large part of it was spent creating a new testing world for, uh, use in testing hardware. And be- oh, look, there's the, there's the World Anvil crew. Hi, World Anvil. Hello, World Anvilers. I'm sure they have a name for them. I'm sure I should know it. Forgers? Probably I'm not. i getting a lot of light up the forge forgers. in chat. Probably I'm guessing something that's... Something different. Smiths. I like Smiths. Let's call them the Smiths. No, wait, that's a band. Um... Anvilites, sure. Welcome, 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 World Anvil folks. Uh, we're going to have a guest in a little bit later that some of you will very likely recognize from your own weekly streams, so feel free to stick around while we grill Kaora on uh, usage of Foundry VTT and involvement with World Anvil and all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, if you're here for the first time, uh, we're a monthly uh, general talk show, I guess is how I'd put it, about events related to the Foundry Virtual Tabletop community. Uh, you may recognize me by name, Anathema Mask, from some of the World Angle streams where I hang out occasionally and chat when I'm supposed to be working. Don't tell the boss. Of course, if you'd like to consume this content in a podcast um, format, just close your eyes and listen along. Absolutely, yes. Uh, I I don't envy you the audio experience of just hearing Cody and I talk only without the visuals. But, you know, actually that may be better. Oh, the boss is in chat. He uh, heard that. Um, (coughs) Deflect. Yeah, uh, this week I spent most most of the week working on testing world to try and get things uh you know try and provide a a steady hardware testing environment because uh the boss has been neck deep in the code mines trying to figure out ways to improve performance and uh precision in lighting and vision rendering which is a field that i know nothing about and everything he does bewilders me when he's working on it uh Cody, you're a little bit more code involved. How do you perceive Andrew's work on lighting and vision? Well, he has been working on some really nice um, debug tools. So they at least like show, you know, what rays are being generated and then how they get cold and what points are considered, which lets me go from having no idea what he's saying to I like lines and colors. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's very complicated and and I definitely barely know what's going on. Um, that said, there has still been really impressive work. I've enjoyed following along with it. I hope one day I can at least like understand what's going on in there. Um, uh, that said, you should tell them yeah, about it's... your your chaos map. 
Oh, the the one that I needed you to to generate an export so that I could use, you know, additional special ways to grab. So um, part of the testing process is, of course, you want to provide a, a map that completely overloads the system. You want something excessive that the software is definitely not meant to be able to handle. Um, so using the uh, cavern generator in Dungeon Draft and the Dungeon Draft uh, importer feature, um, at maximum possible tiles, fidelity, resolution, um, Cody and I produced a cavern map, uh, 16,384 pixels by 16,384 pixels with 38,000 walls in Foundry Virtual Tabletop. Uh, the intent was to make a wall map that would just, it should make Foundry crash. The, it should not function. So, in version 9, dev 1, uh, it, it barely functions. It loads and it renders. Uh, once I realized that was the case, I decided to add more than 300 lights to it as well, knowing that the lights in Foundry BTT are more performance consuming than the walls. Uh, so once that was set up, uh, it was running at 1.7 frames per second. Uh, basically unusable. Uh, using a uh, measured move, the performance was 46 seconds to move a token six squares. Um, and then I loaded into the boss's new lighting and vision algorithm. And it performed the move on that map in four seconds. And then I drag moved and it did it in less than a second. So I don't know which dark patron it is that he has sacrificed to, to accomplish this task, but, uh, I, I don't have words for the level of success it's been. I'm scared to see it once it goes out into the public and, you know, people start finding ways to destroy it, but uh, the performance gain is significant. I already thought our lighting engine was efficient and good. I... I don't think I've ever heard of anyone running a map that large. Um, but at this point, at that efficiency, you could almost put, like, have an entire campaign map in one scene and explore it and have your whole campaign without ever swapping scenes. I don't recommend that, but we're, we're getting to that point. Um, I have a map like that. Who should I send it to, Atropos? Yeah, if you, if you have some um, interesting stress test maps, I, just... Send us on Discord. So the reason the reason I'll counter Cody on that and say don't is uh, part of the requirements I, I gave myself for building this testing world was ensuring that the maps could be distributed in case we wanted to release this testing world to the general public. Uh, so all of the maps currently included are ones from our exclusive map pack, map pack map packs already uh, or they are ones that we created solely for the task using assets that are you know freely available uh, so please don't send us your stress test maps we we have ways uh, but you know working on lighting wasn't the only thing we've done um We've certainly done a lot others. I mean, it's all public information. It's all in our, you know, um, GitLab. But, you know, I, I think we'll be having a stream. Are we doing a Dev2 stream? Or are we going to wait till after testing one?
Yes, next I... week we're doing a dev stream, so let's not spoil that stream's excitement. Um, and let you know, there have been other things we've been doing. For instance, uh, Matt and I played in a charity event last weekend. Um, we do get breaks, but apparently it's to you know do hammering it out and extra and play tabletop games for charity. But it was a lot of fun. It was my first time playing Pathfinder Second Edition uh, at all. I, we played it in Foundry. We played it with some of the people who made the system, uh, and we raised over three point three thousand dollars for children um, for charity, donating to various hospital networks. And of that, three hundred dollars was donated to throw me personally under the bus. I would have to reroll my next roll and take the worst result. I did die on stream, but I did it for charity, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, that vod is currently still. I heard if you die on stream. stream, you die in real life. Is that true? Yeah, wh why do you think I look so pale? My contract uh, yeah, with that makes sense. Andrew, uh, though, meant I couldn't just pass on. I'm not allowed to die within the first year. Um, but yeah, no, you can check out the VOD of that on right. the, the Twitch, and it'll be uploaded to YouTube in a couple days. Didn't you guys raise something like 30 times what the the Paizo, like, home team achieved. I, I imagine that's changed since, but... I damn, that's don't a lot know of money. the final numbers, and, you know, certainly it's not a competition, right? Accepting that, you know, it's always fun to brag. Yeah, no, we, the fa the Foundry team, last I checked, had outraised every other path Paizo-related Extra Life team, which is just... I, I love this community and how, you know... How, how engaged they are and how much that they're willing to, you know, help others out. Oh yeah. Still sitting at the top Paizo team by $3,000 above next highest. Damn you guys. Damn. That's I, I, I would, good, I would say money. that like, although our stream was hopefully fun to watch, well, there was also a lot of really good incentives, you know, unlocking extra bosses at certain amounts. Um, you know, adding, you know, throwing me under the bus, getting coasters sent, get, getting one shots run at certain amounts. So incentives do drive people doing stuff. And they, the, the incredible volunteer team of the Pathfinder volunteered literally like a hundred more hours of running games for people and such as part of this charity. So it's just incredible. Uh, the PF2E dev team is a very interesting bunch of people. I'm I'm super proud of how much they accomplished over this. I know Timon was working on it for like he only had like a week to put it together, so super impressive. Oh, there there's the one there's the, the question from this week. At once a once a month, whenever we run one of these streams, someone asks if there's been any news on a 5e partnership uh yes there's absolutely news the news is we have nothing to announce at this time um the uh the the <coughs> the thing that i always tell people is it isn't subtle we aren't forgetting to tell people if we have an announcement to make we absolutely will be shouting it from the rooftops. Um, I'm no, I not know. even a... Sorry, go ahead, Cody. I know there is... Um, Wizards has put out a survey recently asking about, you know, the future of Dungeons and & Dragons and such. And depending on what you answer, one of those questions is, what other places would you like to find, you know, Dungeons & Dragons content? Some people have been using that survey to indicate their, you know, indicate interest in bringing you know 5e content and other things to foundry um if you're interested i don't know where that survey is um but you know plenty of people have been uh mentioning it and sharing it around so i'm sure you could find it that's telling publishers that you would like to see their content on a platform is one of the better ways you can you know add support towards the idea just you know be polite about it Oh, apparently the survey expired, so... I'm I'm gonna really 
drive home the point, be polite about it. Um, there's, there's a trend and we love our fan base. We really do. We love that you guys are spreading things by word of mouth, but there's a trend of, uh, let's say emphatic evangelists who really want everyone to love Foundry as much as they do. And it's great. I, I love that these people are out there, but not everyone needs to like the thing you like as much as you like it. And while I love our community, we, we have a massive following. Maybe scale back things shy of, if you're not using this product, I hate you and everyone like you. <laughs> it's a little bit excessive. Yeah, ju just as how, you know, indicating politely, you know, like, hey, I would love to see your content on Foundry is a great way of, you know, helping to build that support. Going to them and being like, you guys are the worst people on the planet because you don't have your content on Foundry is a great way to lose a ton of support for that idea really quickly. Um, that said, uh, speaking of Foundry and our lovely community, if you want to see mo some of us in person, Foundry will be in person at PAX Unplugged this coming December. Um, it will be Andrew and Matt and I, and we will be hosting a panel along with two creators. Um, I uh, definitely did know their names and now it's i'm too focused on the fact we have a guest in a few minutes my head has lost them um but it's two other content creators um and we will be having a panel about you know digital content and adapting things for virtual tabletop and, and you know what those experiences are like um we will be there That's come nice. say hi to us um attend our panel the panel we don't think will be streamed i don't believe pax on plugged is doing any streaming but we're not sure um just real quick the uh the people that will be attending the panel uh it's max wartell some of you may know as humperdink from heliana's guide to monster hunting also uh alex hitchin or you guys definitely know as the mad cartographer uh who will also be in attendance i won't be because I am not in the States, not interested in traveling, and that's way too many people for me to be around. One of these days, Nath, I'm hoping we can do Hammering It Out Live. It would be interesting being that not sober for a interview. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't know if Pax has the cameras even i don't know if these are being recorded if they don't have a camera they can't stream it um often convention centers have poor internet you know often they don't have the av set up for that kind of thing um i know it is disappointing in the era you know in this la in this era of you know this last year everything's been online uh, but a lot of places lack the technology to have hybrid events where that are you know in person but streamed online um i mean they are a big convention but it's likely whatever the convention center has. Yeah, I'm I'm not shocked that there's kind of a, a bit of wiggle room with regard to live streaming the event. Sometimes they have that kind of setup, sometimes they don't. I would expect of all the conventions, PAX would be the one. But at the same time, you know, who actually knows? Um, we certainly don't have the streaming gear and capacity to take everything and set it up in advance. Uh, anything new in terms of card support? Not really. Uh, we've refined it a bit uh, with regard to V9, D2. There's some U more UX and UI stuff coming in the V9 testing, but uh, right now it's in a pretty good place for system developers and module developers to work with. Couple of bugs. Always a couple of bugs. 
Well, for those who are disappointed that they might not be able to see us in person talking to some creators about content creation for Foundry, why don't we jump into talking with our guest, who is a content creator, here to talk about creating content in Foundry. And other things. I don't know. Can we can we do that? Can we just segue into an interview smoothly? Is that something that we're Uh-oh. able to do? Uh, I see Matt has set up a new uh, throw me under the bus. <laughs> I'm what glad we're getting a good news on that. Guys. That was amazing. You know, I think that segue was too smooth. Can we go back, Matt? Can we just we go to... back and find a worse segue? I can't do it like this. I need a better intro. Come on. Um, everyone, thank you so much. Please welcome me, help me in welcoming KR onto the stream. <laughs> How is it going? Hey guys, thank you so much. So, for those of you unaware, Kaora is one of our community, a kind of all over the place guy when it comes to just being involved in a variety of communities for map making and a variety of projects. Uh, I know you're you're on World Anvil like bi-weekly. You're <laughs> involved in Project Deos. You're you're kind of everywhere. I, I'm almost at a point where I can't search for like content creation without your name showing up somewhere. So I'm um, I'm pretty impressed by that, and being able to interview is is good. I'll I'll save my personal how do I make my maps not suck questions for a little bit later. Uh, yeah, just send me a DM. I'll I'll get back to you in well, about three weeks. <laughs> yeah. So why don't we start with one of one of our most common questions? Uh, something we ask pretty much everyone who comes on the stream. Who are you? What do you do? What are your credentials? What made you choose this life? Oh, man. Uh, 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 uh. That's a big question. I guess, uh, first of all, I didn't really choose to do this. Um, I kind of... Uh, I came into doing the map making gig by, by accident, really. Because um, after I got my degree in game design... Um, I was looking for a job and I couldn't get a job uh, here in the UK. Uh, I I graduated just as Brexit happened, <laughs> which was great and uh, affected a few jobs in you know Europe and places like that. So that was fun. And while I was looking for a job, I decided, well, fuck it, I might as well uh, make my own uh, content. So I started. Uh, I I wrote a little adventure. And I drew the maps for it. And uh, some of the feedback that I got for the adventure was, oh, you should you should, you should check out Patreon. You should put your maps on Patreon and, and draw some more maps. And I was like, okay, sure. So I started a Patreon and it was about two months before I actually started posting any content. And then I got a few people joining. I was like, great, I'm currently unemployed. This is more money that I'm getting per month than I would normally get. Let's keep making some maps. And, uh, yeah, I just kept doing it and kept making more money and decided, hey, I can, I can make a, a, a living out of this. Uh, it took a while, but yeah, that's, that's how it all sort of, you know, very, uh, unorganically happened. Sometimes the most interesting opportunities are like that, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But yeah, I mean, like, um, I think... Some of the, like, I think I've been working on some pretty big projects. Like, you mentioned I've, I've worked for World Anvil. Like, I haven't really worked for them, but I do work with them on, like, streaming stuff. And uh, World Anvil uses a lot of my maps for their, like, marketing and stuff like that, which is awesome. I'm good friends with uh, Dimmy and Janet, who, who run World Anvil. And, um, you know, I've done some work for um, Humblewood as well, like, on their Kickstarter Um Stuff like that. That's pretty cool. Oh, I did a map for Critical Role as well. Uh, not for the main show, but um, for one of their sideshow projects, which I was like really, really happy to do. Um, and I got that gig through Devin Roo, which uh, another really uh, amazing content creator, map maker. And yeah, I think I just I make all types of different content. Really, I do tokens and assets, um, you know, to help people, you know, f fill out their scenes and make their own stuff. You know, for Foundry um, and things like that. 
And I also do a few battle maps and uh, region maps and, and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, just yeah, I... make that kind of stuff. You uh, you mentioned tokens, and and I have to say that I'm uh, I'm a big fan of your definitely not Zelda tokens. <laughs> yeah, they're, uh, they're really fun and impressive, and it had to be a fun little project to take on. Uh, I I quite I quite like making things that are iconic and thematic, and a lot of games have really cool thematic stuff in them. So Zelda, obviously. I did some Subnautica creatures, you know, all the underwater leviathans and little little fish guys and things like that. Because, you know, you look at that and you kind of think, oh, that's cool. You know, if you're if you're playing in an underwater scene in Foundry or something, you you kind of want to like little little uh, I can't remember the little names, little peepers like running around. That'd be great. Um, so yeah, I like doing that. I kind of toe the line with getting away with making that kind of content by just making it and giving it away for free. So it's it's more like fan art than, you know, anything commercial, but it's it's fun. It's definitely fun stuff to make. Um, as one of your patrons, um, one of the things I like about your st- art style is that it is a distinct style. I Now, I'm not an art person, so I apologize, but there's like more shading shadow it's like stylized what do, what do you call that style how did you arrive at it i don't know i don't have an art background like i didn't i didn't start with any kind of art like uh training or anything like that um if you look back at some of my early work it was really really rough and i've gradually sort of made it more and more uh, i don't know i guess the word is consistent you know everything has like that style but i don't really know what that style is called other than i like to think of it more of as like a world of warcrafty kind of style you know very saturated colors that you say and like very uh stylized um and nice and bright most of the time although i have tried to experiment with darker uh sort of assets and tokens recently with some lovecraft stuff um, but yeah, it's 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 a style, uh, but I don't really know what it is. Um, what an, an, like a, a trained artist would call it. Um, it's just my style, I guess. I mean, I think you can. I think you're allowed to just call it the Kara style. I think yeah, maybe. Allowed. Yeah. Um, I was, yeah, no, I, I like it because the thicker outlines help pop the tokens from busy scenes, so it's mm-hmm. a little easier to see that token. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, I. I I, that's, uh, it, that's actually one of the reasons that I sorry that's one of the reasons that I actually uh, more often use portrait style tokens than top down is because it's I find it difficult sometimes to notice where a token is if the colors blend a little bit with the background less of an issue with the Kaora style because you do have that thicker like I'll, I'll say thicker lining mm. I think one of the other things I like to do as well is to make sure that there's a highlight on the important bits of the token so they don't blend into the background. So the face is always lighter than the the hands or the feet or the, you know, the cape or whatever it is. So that means that when you're looking around the scene, you're immediately fo- your eye focuses on the face or the, the top of the head or the weapon, you know, the thing that you're going to be able to spot um, in amongst a bunch of other stuff, which is pretty cool. Like, that's kind of the you know, good, um, you know, visualization of a scene when you can see where the important bits are. That's something I try and do anyway. Um, so you mentioned that you start with a game development degree. Um, have you used your assets to make any games? Uh, yes, I have. Um, uh, somewhat recently, maybe about six months, um, eight months ago, I was testing um, a little game project in Unity where I was trying to make a little um, sort of top-down uh, exploring little world with my uh, map-making assets and my little tokens. Um, I'm not the greatest coder in the world, <laughs> so it kind of I run into a few stumbling blocks where I couldn't get something to work properly. So I was just like, oh, you know, it's fine. It looks cool. Uh, and I'm sure it would be amazing. Um, but the other problem I ran into as well is I couldn't, you know, dedicate a lot of time to it because, you know, Boundary and, um, you know, sorry, my Patreon and stuff and making content for that is is kind of the priority for me. Um, yeah. 
funny. So, you know, it's it's fun, and, and I, I do like making uh, little projects like that from time to time. Um, I, I do want to do, like, more game jams as well, but, um, again, time. <laughs> we have some people making video... We have one person making a video game in Foundry, so, you know, you can just merge your hobbies, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's terrible advice. Don't ever tell anyone to do that, he said, as he learns to code <laughs> while trying to incorporate the tabletop role-playing game that he's been building for years. Yeah. Yeah, I find it very difficult to build my own world so now that I make maps all the time. <laughs> yeah, really, right? So, we've been talking for a bit about your involvement with, you know, map making, that kind of thing, tokens, working with Foundry, and how did you discover Foundry Virtual Tabletop? What brought you into our community? Uh, I got sent a link by Atropos, I think. Nice. Uh, Atropos was on my <laughs> Discord and was a, was a patron of mine and had, and had given me a few maps, and had posted a few maps, I think, or a few, like, things. And had chatted a few times. Um, and then I got a link. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. They're like, yeah, I'm working on this. I was like, oh, that's great. Um, and I became a Patreon of Foundry very, very early on. Like, I think Hatchpro sent me the link to their, to their Patreon. And I was like the 10th Patreon? Um, or something like that. Very early wow. on. Yeah. So yeah, I, I've I've known about Foundry for a long time, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, since then I've just been sort of uh, I used it very early on. Um, I think uh, when it was really early on, I was doing some little stuff um, just after, just after like um, I've probably been doing map making them for about a year, maybe a year and a half. But yeah, it was it was early on. Yeah, and now we have a talk show, and now you're, we're all still well, we are, we're all still on Patreon, and now we're in fact onboarding you to our new Patreon system that will enable people to install your Foundry modules and authenticate it with their Patreon subs. Do you want to talk about what that's? You're one of our early adopters, our early <laughs> access creators that we're working with to verify the system works as. We all want. Do um, you want to talk a little bit about how that process has been? Oh yeah, no, that's pretty cool. So basically, for those of you that um, if you don't know, um, you know, Patreon has content that's hosted on it through this the subsystem, right? So when you're supporting at a certain level, you get access to that stuff. Um, and it would be nice, like one of the things I like to do as a creator is I like to have all of my content at that tier available to the people at that tier pretty much forever. So um, you know, if you sub to me at a, a, a higher tier, any of my old content that I've made, you can just access. You can download it, and you can use it, and whatever. And But you'll also gain access to new stuff as it comes out, but you'll also have full access to old content. So, one of the things that I wanted to do when um, Atropos was talking to me about, you know, doing Patreon content and, and hosting those kinds of modules and things was basically like a big pack or a big module that would contain pretty much all of my, not just free stuff, but all of the stuff from my Patreon um, that people can just click a button and they can have it accessible in Foundry uh, without having to download it or do anything, um, you know, crazy with it, you know, having to play around with the file structures and all that kind of stuff. All you have to do is press a button. And I think that's really cool for the user because it just makes it that much faster to set up a scene or to set up a, you know, like an encounter or to get a game ready. Um, and time is money, so you know that's really cool for for that purpose. So um, so far, I've just been working on getting the file structure, um, like trying to get all the the assets and try and name them, and you know get them all sort of sorted out. It's a bit of an organizational thing, um, and I think I, I finished it today, uh, yesterday, and was like fiddling around with it uh, today as well. Um, and I'll send that over to Foundry guys <laughs> to, and to Andrew to have a look at um, and see what other work needs to be done in order to get that all set up and um, 
and out to people to start testing the system because then people can actually see if it works, you know, see if they can, if they're a sub for me on, on Patreon, can they just press the button in Foundry and get all that content? Hopefully it's I mean, that simple. We hope. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> so far, the answer is yes, but that, you know, that's part of the reason we're starting with, you know, a couple of creators and mm -hmm. then, you know, going from there. Um, yep. we'd, we'd prefer to, you know, if we do have issues of scale and such, you know, hit it with like one or two people instead of every creator all at once. Um, yeah, well, we're so excited that you are, you know, willing to take that minor risk and, uh, and join on. And if you yeah. guys want to help us test this new feature, I guess you can subscribe to Kaora's Patreon. Yeah, great plug. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. It's subtle. I don't think anyone noticed. No, I don't think they did. I think we're good. Definitely not chilling. Um. So, God, you you make a lot of art. Like you, I I've looked at your website. I've I've gone through some of your content packs. You've got a lot. What's your creative process like? What do you? What do you spend your time? Like, do you have a, a scheduled checklist you try and work through, or is it more of a free flowing? Just, I think today I'm going to make a horse and carriage. Like, mm, what's yeah, your creative process it, like? I would describe it as anxious panic. Um, uh, <laughs> no, uh, no, I do have a process. So I have. Um, Obviously, I'm a very visual person, so I work with um, sort of... Uh, in, images inspire me. So if I see a piece of concept art or a character or something like that, um, typically that can inspire me to make something out of that. Although it might take a long time for that to actually be made. So it might go in my folder of, this is cool, I can make an asset pack around this concept, or I can make a token around this idea, or, or something like that later on down the line. But I have a kind of a rough kind of checklist and then I kind of do things in stages so because the way that I do art is I do the line art and then I do the color typically I'll do line art for things and then I might leave it for a little bit um, let it sort of you know bake a little a little more and then come back to it and try and fiddle with it a bit more and then do the coloring pro process um, and that goes for maps and tokens and assets and everything like that so I do have a current sort of pile that I've got that I'm working on um, that includes some tokens and some token packs and asset packs and things like that and a few maps um, that I can just work on um, once I'm going you know crazy and I'm just like oh yeah cool let's start working on this um, but because it's a creative process it's quite hard to just you know um, get into the workflow pro process all of the time so sometimes I sort of mix it up you know do some drawing do some work um, on actual content production and then I might, you know, spend a day doing stuff where it's more like organizing and social media and, you know, keeping up to date on the website and doing all other, you know, marketing stuff and things like that. So kind of like a mixed bag, um, but it works kind of well because um, it's only um, I have a partner, uh, Ktech, um, who is who does some of the token line art for me, um, but she doesn't do it uh, sort of full time. So it's kind of. It's quite hectic, just the two of us to to manage all of the different aspects of of a you know a Patreon like ours. Um, but it seems to work. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> we get out quite a lot of stuff uh, every month. Yeah, it's good to hear that you have support. So, I was actually about to ask if you worked with anyone else. Mm. Yeah, and I, I contract out some some other work. So to, um, for other projects and things, but it's mainly just the two of us that work on the main. Um, you know, art production and content. So there's an awful lot of map making softwares, token artwork softwares, mm -hmm. just general art softwares. What do you use in terms of like an application suite for your work? Yeah, that's interesting because I get that I get that question a lot because obviously somebody will look at my work and be like oh, you know, I, that looks cool. I want to make my own maps. How do you do it? And um, I think that there are better ways of doing it than how I do it, but I use Photoshop. 
um, because I've always used Photoshop and I'm set in my ways and uh, it's a very good tool. Um, it works. I like the cloud features for saving my work because Photoshop can crash or any art program can crash because normally, well, you're working with a lot of layers and uh, things like that uh, and sizes for maps can sometimes be pretty big, especially when I'm doing world maps or region maps that are, you know, um, quite large. So yeah, um, having the cloud feature is pretty good and it's a pretty, up, you know, it's updated quite regularly. It is, however, really expensive. So if you're starting out, I wouldn't necessarily recommend using Photoshop. Um, you know, there are other really good programs out there for getting started and, and, and working with, you know, getting used to the, like, you know, having a tablet or a pen and things like that. So um, probably the one I would suggest is um, Clip Studio Paint which is a Japanese program, I think, or um, very Japanese anime inspired. And it's pr pretty much like a, an art program first, whereas Photoshop has art features and it's more of a photo, uh, you know, editing software. Um, so that's what I would recommend. And in terms of like tablets and, um, you know, how you actually draw, I'd say you don't need anything fancy. Um, buy a little tablet with a pen, um, I still use this little tablet, a little Wacom, um, that has a pen with it, and it's fine. It works just as well as having like a screen tablet or something that's worth thousands of dollars. You don't need that kind of stuff to do really nice art. I can do really bad art for really cheap. <laughs> you can, you can we, do really um, bad We art have an now. internal <laughs> policy that we, um... We, we banned Cody from using paint.net. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's poor man's Photoshop, all right. It was, <laughs> it was our, and I was the driving force behind it, but Cody has created some abominations that uh, <laughs> should never, should never have seen the light of day. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just steer him into the code mines away from the art mines. Good, good, it's good. <laughs> Uh, now, a, a bunch of people are asking about your licensing and such, um, yeah. and I, I know you have a fairly unique license in that you actually allow commercial use of your stuff at a certain tier. Uh, mm -hmm. So this enables people to subscribe and you know at a certain tier and use your art and their for sale products and such. Mm -hmm. um, what inspired you to make such a thing, and has there been what's your favorite thing that you've seen someone use it in? Uh, well, I'll start off by saying that there's somebody on Twitter, I can't remember their handle um, off the top of my head, they've made some really amazing maps um, using my Greek assets that I did a, um, about a year ago um, that I was just blown away with. I was so happy with some of the, they were top-down battle maps and they were beautiful temples and there was a few um, night versions and, and day versions and things like that with glowing braziers and things. I was just like, that's beautiful. That That's one of the best examples of stuff. Um, I do have to say as well that, um, and I'm not trying to suck up to you, Andrew, if you're listening, but Andrew makes some really nice um, battle maps using my stuff. Um, uh, one of the one of the maps that Andrew made for, um, for their own game. Um, it's like the spooky tree thing, but they used the PNG of one of my map trees to, and then did loads of corpses around it. I don't know. It was great. It looked really nice. I didn't um, know the hanging tree was actually I'm, originally a Kaora asset. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh yeah, totally is. Um, I'm, I'm actually in the game that that occurred in and, okay. uh, it was an impressive situation to walk into as, <laughs> really one of one of two melee fighters in the group uh, having to deal with a tree that kept throwing animate corpses at us while dealing with a teleporting spellcaster it was um yeah it, it's certainly That's something fun. I'm looking forward to subjecting other people to in the uh, in the near future potential spoiler there <laughs> yeah no um uh that people make some really great stuff with my with my stuff and i i, I love the fact that people use so much so many of my tokens with other people's maps as well 
because obviously I don't make that many battle maps anymore. Um, there are a lot of very, very good battle map makers um, out there that are making super amazing content, and some of them really fit with my token style as well. Um, so I know that that's really cool. But to answer your other question about my commercial license um, sort of thing, I'm really happy for people to use the work that I've already made to create their own projects, as long as it's not just the thing that I've made. You know, if, if they're taking a pack that I've already made and selling on, I'm not okay with that. But if they're using it as part of like, you know, a package where they've done some writing and they've got all this other stuff and they've made sort of an encounter with it and they've done all this other work to actually make it useful and so that other people can improve their games or make their games faster or do all this other kind of stuff, that's awesome. And um, that's why I made the commercial license in the way that I did because, you know, people want to be able to make their games quicker and easier and more fun to use. Um, and the more tools that they have to do that, the better. Uh, as we round... It, it's up, it's not ahead. one that our community has asked just yet. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, we just totally talked over each other for several seconds. Um, it's definitely not something that our community has asked yet, but I know you used to take um, kind of commission work from mm. your website. Is that something that's still open, or have you had to slow that down because of your other involvements? Or Yeah, so I have to... I'm basically... I do have... I will work with a company or an individual if they have a very compelling project or idea and, you know, a lot of money <laughs> to tempt me away from focusing on Patreon work. But usually I try not to get too involved with commissions because it doesn't work out very well for me in the, in the short term or long term. Because typically with a commission, it's only really useful for the person that is commissioning it. Especially if it's an inv individual who's commissioning me for a setting map. You know, that setting map can only be really used by that one individual. Yes, potentially other people could use it to make their own worlds and things like that but it's quite limited in its use. So instead, I quite like, you know, focusing on Patreon and making assets and tokens that hundreds of people, if not thousands of people can use, because that's going to be better off for me on Patreon and for everybody. So generally, that's where my sort of thinking is around there. But it's kind of like, if somebody sort of like, you know, sends me a message saying, hey, I've got, you know, two million dollars and I work for Wizards of the Coast and <laughs> I want you to make this. I'll be like, oh, OK, sure. Well, if um, you say so. Well, you know, um, so, yeah, sometimes sometimes I, I do, you know, the occasional sort of like bits and pieces, um, you know, for exciting projects. But generally speaking, I don't. Don't touch commissions as much as I used to. Uh, we're going to, we have a couple more, but um, we're going to get to the part where the community gets to ask you some questions directly. Uh, if you're watching now and you'd like to ask Kara a question, go ahead and drop it in Twitch chat and put, you know, question and, you know, before your question so we can easily find it. And we will ask away. Um, we already had another licensing question asking about, do you do agreements and, or partnerships with other content creators? You mean collaborations and things like that? Uh, uh, what was the question? I'm not sure if they're specifically asking about licensing agreements or col collabs, so I guess both? Yes. Um, I do I do, do other things with other content creators, like collabs and things like that. Um, I do have some separate licensing stuff set up with some other people as well. So, yes. Uh, not sure how detailed your question was, but um, generally, yes. Any big collabs you're currently in the middle of? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, well, no, I can't talk about that one, but I can say that uh, uh, I am working with Foundry um, with a. We're, we're, I'm working with Andrew directly on something at the moment, and uh, Andrew messaged me today and said. You can talk about it a little bit if you want. And I was like, oh, no, maybe we shouldn't. And I was just like, well, you know, it's up to you. So I'm going to mention it now and just say, I'm working with Andrew on something um, for Foundry. But I'm not going to tell you what it is. 
What's the best talk team? show if we can't get hot What's gossip ahead team? of time? Um. So yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, the the official Foundry Kaora drawn 1970s fantasy van. That's that's what's yeah. happening. We can tell people it's okay. So okay. All right. I will tell you what's happening. We're- so Foundry is getting an office, like a proper office. Um, you guys are hearing about this for the first time. Oh, and yeah. Andrew is flying me out, and I'm going to be painting a mural on your office wall. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> this is where uh, our Patreon money goes. <laughs> we will be offering Foundry office tours. Um, our tour guide will be Matt. Yeah. There will be a short bus tour. It will run me over. you got to pay back the rent somehow. All right, we got some great community Obvi- questions. Obviously, people, this... Obviously, people, we are joking. Neither the 1970s-style fantasy van with the, like, sword held high and the creatures in the background, that's not happening. There's no There's no office. There's no murals. That's... Maybe one day. <laughs> Unlikely, but... Maybe one day. Maybe one day. Uh, now, if I will we always some continue to be questions. the Canadian branch. Sure, you go ahead. German Andrew Boat asks, do you build any maps or assets with modules in mind, such as um, levels or multi-level integration? So, uh, for those who are confused by that um there are certain foundry modules that change how you think about scenes in foundry you know by default you have one level but there are some that let you think in one scene have you know walk between the first and second level of a building um yes um i have a map called the howling deep which is a multi-level tavern um that has a an open walkway so the second level you look down on the first level um which is pretty cool um, I don't draw battle maps as much as I used to to take full advantage of that kind of thing, but it's a very interesting thing to think about with with battle maps because height, I think, is a really interesting gameplay mechanic to think about. Uh, I think more maps need to take advantage of that um, from for gameplay purposes. Uh, to have you know goblins on top of little towers shooting down is way more exciting than having, you know, a flat plane, um, you know, and people are just walking or running around between these points, your monsters. They should be climbing up and, you know, throwing goblins off of the, the towers and things like that. Um, that's the kind of stuff that can make an encounter really special and really dynamic and really interesting. So, Yeah, you know, I occasionally uh, bump into people who, you know, are dismissive of features or spells or things like that in games that aren't raw damage that you know give you additional Mm. movement that give you you know that let you fly and they're like oh that's not mathematically optimal and i feel like these people need to be given more interesting maps with more terrain Mm. and height and objectives so that it's not just killing as many people in a straight line as possible as fast as possible yeah, absolutely. I think it's really fun, and, and it takes advantage of some of the rarely used abilities and spells and things like that um, for role-playing games, you know, like D&D or Pathfinder, where you get to use them in interesting ways or combine them with other abilities in interesting ways that can make an encounter feel a bit more special. So, yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, some of the battle maps that I have planned, um, I think I've got some ship battle maps um, on my pipeline. Um, which have multiple levels or, and grates where you can see down into the hold and things like things like that. And crow's nests on top of the sails, you know, that you can have as like a multi-level thing and you can, you know, shoot down or, you know, have better vision over the scene and things like that. So, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that I think is, is pretty cool and really, really, really fun. Uh, Guacamole asks, do you use any tools for choosing and managing your beautiful colors or palettes of colors? Uh, hmm, that's an interesting question. I don't have a tool. Um, I think I've always had a... I think, um... 
one of my weaker spots, I guess, as a as an artist, um, is actually the line art. Like, I think I my line art is kind of okay. Um, I think a lot of the stuff that I make is actually made better by my color. I think my color is pretty cool, and I'm not really sure where that comes from. Um, I don't have a like a palette um, like tool where I've like got all of these like colors all figured out. I kind of do it on the fly. Um, and the only place that I can think of that I got that from was painting miniatures um, okay. like a long time ago. You know, different colors and blending them and doing all these different things and, and reading White Dwarf um, painting tutorials in the old magazines. Um, what I what used kind to... of minis did you paint? What, how were? What kind of, what kind of miniatures were you painting? Uh, like Warhammer 40k and Warhammer Fantasy. I had a Dwarven army way 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 back when i was a uh, you know still in school um and then i had some dark elves um and things like that and then later on i got into warhammer 40k and i was painting them and i got a lot better then um as i started to paint and my friends would give me their models to paint them as well uh and i was learning pretty advanced techniques at that point you know like looking up because i would buy white dwarf and i was really into it and i was trying to like you know, what are all these pro people, the people, the heavy metal people, the, the Golden Demon or the Daemon Awards, you know, where they're trying to like, they're trying to push the limit with all the colors and trying to do the, like the non-metallic blending and all of this kind of stuff. So I think that's, that's where I get my, my sort of use of color from is sort of miniature painting. Um, but yeah, I think that that's, um, it's, it's, it, it's a very slow process if you do it that way. I would not recommend because <laughs> it's like, mm, yeah, it took me like 10 years to get good at painting miniatures. <laughs> and then, you know, five years, uh, I didn't paint anything at all. And then then I started doing map making. Uh, it's it's yeah, that's it's not recommended. One of my friends got me into, you know, Kill Team a while back. I'm like, okay, cool. I guess uh, these come unpainted. Uh, I guess I can paint them. And God, even as small, the like, Kill Teams are just like a few, like a handful mm. of units. And it's like, I've painted two out of like the 10 in like two years. Um, yeah. I am very slow at painting my minis. And I, uh, who are, anyone who can paint minis at a faster rate than that, I'm like, you go. Well, it's another one of these things where you just have to spend time doing it. And if you don't have like a few hours every night to sit down and paint miniatures, it's going to take weeks or months to finish an army or years. Even I still have my army from uh, years ago, uh, my Space Wolves. Um, my entire army is not painted. I've still got gray plastic models. Um, so, yeah, it's it's one of those things, I suppose. Um, Macaren Taco, Macarena Taco. There we go. Has asked, have you ever done content for tabletop games other than fantasy, such as sci-fi or modern style? Mm. Yeah, I've done a few. I've tried to experiment a little bit and do a few sci-fi bits and pieces. I think it's pretty cool to try and do that kind of stuff. Um, and I actually do want to do a little bit more. The thing that's always held me back from doing other genres, though, is money. Um. And I'll explain that in more detail by saying fantasy is the dominant genre for role-playing games. Dungeons and Dragons is pretty much dominant in the industry, um, as well as like stuff like Pathfinder and things like that. As fantasy is generally like the thing that most people get into role-playing games through. And if I make content for fantasy, pe more people are going to use it. Um, so it's always a bit hard for me to justify making a sci-fi asset pack or a token pack because it's slightly less, um, you know genre used like people don't use it as much um but i am really interested in it and i love sci-fi stuff um so maybe i'll be able to sneak in some more stuff in the future and just try and and do it because i want to do it uh and i'm sure people will love it um so that's fine <laughs> i think one of the appealing bits about you know fantasy assets and such is that even if you are running a sci-fi game or a western game or a modern game there's always going to be room for running, you know, beasts and, uh, you know, forge mm. or, um, you know, mm. uh, constructs and all these things that are already in fantasy games in your game. Um, whereas 
running, if you have a guy with a sci-fi gun, you know, it, you really can't pull him into those other games. Yeah, um, that's true. It, if you have a cowboy, it's hard, you know, it's at least a little easier to pull into a fantasy game, but, you know. Yeah, I think that's very true. Uh, it, it's harder to, to cross the genres with sci-fi assets uh, or tokens, because they're very, very obviously sci-fi. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, it's fine. I, I think that... Um, I kind of had this discussion with somebody uh, quite recently. Hopefully there's a bit more of a genre evening out as like a new tabletop RPG comes out that's really, really good for sci-fi and loads of people playing it, then it makes it slightly easier to, you know, have a more balanced sort of set of, of, of assets and tokens and make stuff for that genre as well. Um, and who knows, hopefully that will happen in the next few years and people will have a more, you know, balanced, you know, number of games to play. I know our poor sci-fi fans are just yeah, like, I'm... please give us content. Yeah. I've absolutely... I I periodically run modern games in like kind of a pseudo World of Darkness, Chronicles of Darkness kind of setting. And there is an absolute desert of content when it comes to anything past like the 1800s mm -hmm. um you just start running into these situations where like okay there's this one artist has these same five car models that they they've used in different colors so i have cars uh mm -hmm. i don't have any modern walls i don't have any modern looking floors mm -hmm. i don't have any like I've got to go digging for stuff in fantasy packs to make these things work. And it just, it rapidly turns into hunting through like the six artists that are the most common sci-fi and modern asset makers and yeah. looking for places to fill gaps in styles that don't match. I think it's hard, though, because like when sci-fi is not just one aesthetic general, right? If you're talking fantasy, you're generally talking Fox medieval renaissance fantasy. Uh, when you're talking sci-fi, you might have Star Wars fantasy. You might have cyberpunk fantasy. You might have neon, fan you know, cyberpunk or gritty cyberpunk. Like it's there's so many there's so many different variants. So you can't just have sci-fi assets. You have to have the sci-fi assets that match your idea of that. Um, and that's hard. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can have that that like super clean. Everything's like white and shiny and plastic and and ready to go. Or you can have that really gritty, like H.R. Geiger aliens kind of. Yeah, where everything is just dark and gritty and ruined and and leaning towards horror and you can kind of get away subbing in assets from fantasy for things like post-apocalyptic assuming you can find gun assets to use but i have a uh, they're getting out of the the go ahead i was gonna say i have a uh, a subfolder full of um alien references for doing a token pack um that's not currently in the, the pipeline or although it's something that i want to do um, with all the grungy sort of concept art from the original Alien and some of the other movies and, what does, and you know, some of the games that have been made um, around sort of the Alien franchise and things like that because that is a very specific and really awesome look but like you say, if I make that it's only really going to help the people that are running it in that very specific sort of sub-genre of sci-fi so, you know this is not a suggestion to put on your plate, but I, mean, I think it would be popular if someone somewhere were to make a dungeon draft or alternative asset pack of base sci-fi assets in these yeah. different aesthetics, such that someone, other people would then be enabled to go actually make maps with these aesthetics. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, dungeon draft, you know, often looks very samey, but if someone were to make those sci-fi aesthetic assets, they, we might actually see some interesting sci-fi maps in the future. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. The problem is, though, that's that's very easy to say and very difficult to do, because yeah. 
you're not talking about, you know, 50 or 100 assets. You're talking about thousands of assets. Like, the the Kaora packs are well over the hundreds of, of options line. Tom Cardos, all, all Forgotten Adventures, all of the creators making stuff for Dungeon Draft, it's not like 20 or 30 pieces of art. It's thousands. And mm. that's... It's really easy to say, okay, well, I'll make... I'll make an asset pack for this particular style and it'll it'll do well. Well, it probably would, but that's like a year's work. Mm. Yeah, I think that it's something that I had to consider quite a lot. Um, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot for Project Deos, which I'm working with Dungeon Fog on, um, which is more sort of setting maps and things like that. They've already got their own battle map editor. But... Because I'm doing a lot of assets for them for making sort of setting maps and, you know, like world and region stuff, thinking about all these different genres and how many assets are actually going to be needed to make, you know, something feel like a sci-fi world or a cyberpunk world or a post-apocalyptic world and things like that. It's really difficult um, to try and make a pack that only contains 100 assets. Like, 100 assets seems like a lot. Not really. Like, not when you know you are a hundred types of bushes in, like, some of these fat asset packs. Exactly. You know, I've, I've done a mountain pack for Wonder Draft, and it contains something like 70 mountains. That's not enough. I mean, you could, ha you could make a nice varied, like, mountain range with it, but what if you want to make a different kind of mountain range? You know, you don't want to have all your mountain ranges looking the same. You're going to have to have a different kind of mountain drawn, and that's another asset pack and then you know maybe you want three different mountain ranges you need another so it's it's a it's a never-ending problem i'm quite happy from that as somebody that makes money <laughs> making assets there's always going to be another asset pack to make um but uh it does take a very long time to make them that's just mm -hmm. the way it is so i think that kind of addressed the the question i was going to ask next which was from uh, one of our own moderators, Flo Radical, um, he basically wanted to know about, you know, your plans for sci-fi assets and that kind of thing. And I think we've kind of, we've circled around that enough. Um, I know you've done some work and are pretty heavily involved with Project Deos. Mm -hmm. I don't know much about it myself. I've been kind of following it from the periphery, but I wonder if you might be able to share any news or anything that perhaps our audience might not know about uh, Project Deus, what it is, that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, I started working with Till, the CEO and the creator of Dungeon Fog, um, ages ago. Uh, I can't remember exactly what year it was. I think it was 2019. We met at Dragon Meet here in the UK. Uh, he flew over from Austria because Dungeon Fog is a European-Austrian company. They, they're they based in Austria. And um, I think he was friends with Wild Anvil people and he was there talking to Wild Anvil and he met me. Um, I think Till had a cold, so he couldn't talk, but he was kind of like, Oh, hey, your stuff is really good. We should talk. I was like, oh, okay, great. Sure, that, that sounds nice. And uh, sent me a message a few months later saying, oh, we're working on a, a new Kickstarter. Would you like to be involved? And I've, I got involved um, in Project Deus that way. And effectively, Project Deus is the idea that you will be able to make setting maps like world maps and region maps, city maps and battle maps, and even space maps, all in the same program, and they'll all be linked together. So you'll be able to have like layers where you can just click and you'll be able to go through them. Um, and it's a really cool concept because at the moment when you try and find a, a like a map making program you can find one that makes battle maps or you can find one that makes setting maps or you can m maybe even find one that makes a sci-fi map although that's like elusive golden uh, needle in a haystack kind of uh, program but they're not all linked together they're all separate and they all have different styles and different ways of doing things um, but what Project Deus is trying to do is link them all together and have them all be consistent and easy to use and nicely all laid out and all the rest of it. So that's currently what we've been doing. We've work, been working on the project now. Sorry, the Kickstarter was great. It was a great success. Um, we got loads of funding and, and stuff like that. And 
and um, obviously I was um, my, my my part of the project is making the assets. So I'm not making the program. Don't ask me any technical questions about Deos. <laughs> I have no no input in that other than some of the feedback that I give to Till when they ask me about, you know, should this, you know, be like this? I'll be like, oh, maybe, you know, you could try this. This would be good if you're a map maker or if you're trying to make your map this way. But generally speaking, I'm not part of the, the actual development. All I'm making is all the assets. And so far, the alpha is up, like the technical alpha is up for Project Deus right now. So it's still very early on. Um, and the setting stuff, like the, the world map that you can you can make with it is pretty basic, but we're getting a lot of the um, fundamentals down first. So one of the nice things you can do cr currently with Deus is you can make a world scaled map size. So you know, like when you're trying to make a map in Wonder Draft, it's always limited in how big you can make it. Um, with Deus, you're not limited. It's colossal. Like you could technically make um, a world sized map, um, which is really fun and really nice to, to have the option for. Um, and at the moment, I'm sort of going through and making all the asset packs, like I said a bit earlier, kind of like a discussion about how many, you know, need to be made and, you know, all the different settings and, you know, things that people want to use to make loads of different kinds of maps. So that's currently Project Deus. And um, I think it's going pretty well. Yeah. We don't have a release date other than it will be done when it's done. <laughs> But the city map stuff is going to come to the house. We're, uh, we're big fans. We're, we're big fans of the we'll release it when it's ready approach. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So are there any other projects, anything that you're working on that you'd like to share news about with the community or anything that people should check out that you're just really interested in? There is one project that I'm currently working on that I haven't talked about much, um, apart from on my own Patreon and Discord. Um, but I'm currently working with uh, a developer called Darkwill, um, one of the mods on my Discord. Um, and I haven't really talked about this because it's still kind of early, although hopefully in the next... Um, Maybe this month, or maybe even next month, there'll be a, like an early release out on my website. But I'm trying to make a basically uh, a token editor, so that you can make your own tokens using my artwork. And this is something I've talked to Andrew about um, for Foundry as well. So it'll have a button to import it directly into Foundry as well. And this hopefully will be a way for you to create your characters for uh, role-playing games with a few clicks of the button. Um, so, you know, I want this color hair, this face, this weapon, this sort of accessory, this bit and pieces, this color, and boom, it's made for you and you click a button and it's in Foundry. And not only will it have the, um, the, the top-down token, you can also choose to have um, shadow and non-shadowed versions or a circle around it, so it's more of a portrait um, sort of token instead um, and that's basically like something I think is really really cool for an artist like myself who can make the assets for the tokens in a very specific way so that they all are uh, there's kind of like a like a baseline so that everything works with one another so if I make a long sword for one it's going to work for all of them so if you want a a human male fighter um, with a long sword you can you can have that, but if you want a human bard, a human bard male with a with a long sword, you can have that because it will fit the same hand. Uh, and I think that that's the kind of stuff that um, would be pretty cool. That's that sounds super exciting, and I'm actually really interested in that. I am curious about whether or not it will allow for uh, creation of more let's say monster tokens, let's say I'm a GM and I want to put together non-humanoid races. Is that something mm -hmm. that you're planning or am I like pushing a feature, trying to get some scope creep going? No. So part of the, so part of the thing that I, uh, so part of this uh, project is the ability to have some of the very common monster sort of 
you know, not tropes, but you know, like skeletons and gnolls and goblins and kobolds and all of these kind of very common monsters and having the same ability to customize them. So changing their colors and their weapons and things like that. Um, and having all of the different customization that allow you to make characters with them, but also really interesting monsters um, with crowns or with, you know, hats or all of these kind of things to really make them stand out a little bit. And, and having the same options to do that just as you would with a, um, with a, you know, a character, like a player character, enables not only characters to use this, but also GMs, because then they can go in there and they can make cool, interesting, unique monsters that they can then use for their games. Um, people are, some people have asked about if you have plans for animated tokens. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes uh, I'm, not, right. I'm not an animator. Like I'm barely an artist. Uh, I've spent the last uh, four years slowly chugging away, practicing, and you know, drawing every day. Um, I could maybe sit down and learn to animate, um, but it's not currently in my um, plans to do any kind of animated stuff just yet. And maybe it might be cool to to ask somebody or to hire somebody to animate some of my stuff, but it's not currently in the pipeline yeah they mentioned some software called spine which i just looked up which yeah i've heard of it it's supposed to make it easier i'm looking at these images and it's like well, that doesn't look much easier mm. I, I mean ideally i you, al you can always spot the animation people okay you go <laughs> I was going to say, um, it's fine. I mean, the thing is, is I would need to hire more people um, with more expertise than me to do it. And uh, at the moment, that's not really feasible um, because I don't have any experience with animating. I think it's really cool. I think having animated tokens like fires and, and all effects and things like that in Foundry is great. It's a lot more immersive, um, but it's not currently something that I can do personally. So I'm not going to push myself too much. Yeah, there's one person I've yeah. You I, can always like you can always I, tell the animate Cody. It's me. I'm talking. I'm the one who's talking, Cody. <laughs> um, yeah. The <laughs> you can always tell the the animation people in any audience because they always start out with, "Have you thought about using this program? It's it's supposed to make it easier to to do the thing," and then you ask them how it makes it easier and they give you this incredibly technical description of how it improves animation and you just kind of nod like you understood some of those words and then you move away slowly. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I think that I think that people that make animated stuff, um, it's a lot more niche currently in the space. Like, um, but it's certainly, some of the stuff that I've seen people making is is really amazing. Like, it's really cool and it really sets the tone and the theme and the mood when you're playing in a in a scene in, in Foundry. So that's great. But um, yeah, I'm not currently doing that just yet. Maybe I'll hire one in the future and I'll go through my backlog, but at the moment, no. Yeah, I'm... I'm always really impressed to see what some of the animation people in the media and assets room on our, our primary Discord server do. Just people like Jinker and uh, JB2A and, and those folks. Just some really impressive stuff they can turn out in a very short period of time. And I'm over here like, Photoshop brush does thing. <laughs> um, it, it's just a completely different type of art that I don't think I'll ever be able to wrap my head around. Mm. Uh, as we're coming up to the end here, you know, now is a great time for any last minute questions. One of the ones I we like to always ask as we close out is what games are you GMing or playing in? I'm currently not playing or DMing anything. I don't have enough time. <laughs> um... Yeah, I, I, I really want to run a, um, a Pathfinder 2E campaign. Um, hopefully I can I can get a few players, um, some of my friends, uh, to do it over Christmas. Um, and I really do like the the mechanical nature of, of Pathfinder 2E. I, I really, um, I'm really into it a lot more than some other role-playing systems at the moment. 
Um, but I haven't had a chance to actually make anything or, or set up any definitive plans. Because so you just got to find opportunities to try it out uh, for charity streams like I did. Yeah, make it part of my work, you know, do some streams on it or something. And then I'll and then I'll like, you know, have a have an excuse to play. But uh, at the moment, it's been it's quite tough um, to sort of like slide that in amongst all the other stuff that I'm doing. Mm hmm. Well, I think we're out of questions. Um, thank you again for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Um, Nath, any closing thoughts? Uh, no, just really thank you for coming out and, and joining us for talking about your experiences with the various Earth projects you're involved in, as well as with Foundry itself. Um, I'm looking forward to working with you on that project that's coming up that uh, won't be uh, spoiled any further than the fact we are working on a project together uh, as part of the Foundry staff, of course. Um, that's going to be really exciting. I'm, I'm hoping people will enjoy it. Uh, other than that, it's, it's always great to talk to our community creators and thanks for taking time out of your day to, to come and hang out and you know, entertain chat and that kind of thing. Yeah, no worries. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really nice. It's been a pleasure. All right, Cody. Yes. We're back. Just the two of us. It's a Saturday. It's been a long week. We've got another long week coming up. We could end the stream early. What can we What can we talk about? Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. What can we talk about for V9D2 that uh, won't spoil the upcoming dev stream? Ah. Uh, um, I don't know, man. Um, I've been working on the keybind management. It's kind of been like my baby project of the dev cycle um as of dev 2 you'll be able to programmatically set your keybinds uh and change them around um you will, we won't get a ui ux until after that um but i'm looking forward to some developers getting their hands on it trying it out telling me how it's wrong in some way um and then us you know tweaking it before we get it in the hands of general users for testing we don't have a time yet on the stream of when we're doing it, but we will announce it uh, when we have that. Yeah, we're um, we're not entirely sure. Usually, we're gonna do a dev stream uh, either the day it releases, the day before it releases, or the day after. We try and keep it very close to the timeline for when it's actually coming out, uh, just so that people can put their hands on it and not have to remember what was shown off during the stream a week or two behind. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, it's it's usually within 24 hours of the actual release. Outside of uh, that... So we'll open the floor to community questions. I'm sorry, say again? Do we have any upcoming events outside of that stream in PAX? I don't think so. There's nothing there's nothing immediately occurring to me. I'm sure I'll kick myself after the stream when I remember something coming up, but not presently. Um uh, we'll open the floor to some community questions for the next, you know, 10, 15 or so before we call it a day. Uh we've got one out out of the immediately out of the gate from Macarena Taco, who's been extremely questioning during the stream. Uh, I know a lot of material is covered by 13th Age SRD. Are there any plans from Palgrain Press to have official support for Foundry? Um, well, Cody, Cody streams officially on the Palgrain Press uh, Twitch channel on a weekly basis. They're 
may be some stuff in the pipeline, but there is not really a whole lot that we can share or any information that we can provide other than theoretically there are some products in the pipeline for Foundry from Pelgrane. That's all we know. I will be very excited the day that ever becomes a thing. Um, I know Pelgrane is, like many publishers, a very small company. I think they have like five employees um, and a bunch of contractors. Um, it tickles my heart that I've that this we've gotten a thirteenth stage question finally after like how you know as long as we've done this. Um, yeah, no, if you want to watch, I am currently no. playing through the eyes of the ca- uh, Stone Thief on uh, twitch.tv slash Pelgrim Press every Monday from 7 to 9 p.m. CS- CDT. Yeah, it's it's only been seven episodes and two like side episodes where uh, where you you haven't gotten the 13th age question. I'm going to real quick take this uh, card support question. So for those of you in the audience who have not heard me espouse my personal opinions on D20 based role playing games, um, I am someone who plays in a D&D game run by Atro, uh, 5th edition. I am firmly of the opinion that's the last D20 game that I will ever participate in. I just, it's not a system for me. So, uh, the reason that relates directly to card support, this question from German Drewboat, um, can you explain card support from a function standpoint? I, I visually picture a deck of many things being integrated, but I don't have a mind to the mind to go beyond that. So D and D five E does have some side games and, and packages that, as I understand it, involve cards, the deck of many things. There's something about, uh, Taroka decks for, um, I think that's curse of Strahd. And I think there's one more. Um, Games like Savage Worlds Adventure Edition uses cards for initiative. Uh, There's a bunch of games, Castle Falkenstein's one that was pointed out to me by, I think, our moderator Magic Hate Ball that uses cards for everything. Um, I, for the last more than decade, closing on 15 years, have been working on a role-playing game that is entirely cards-based. It uses no dice. There are no dice in the system whatsoever. It is every player gets a deck. Every player has a hand of cards. Actions are determined by resolving card opposition. Um, I think it works. I'm obviously biased. I think it works pretty well. But... This is just one of the many advantages to having a full featured virtual tabletop is that I can now, instead of having to do a hacky workaround for my own cards based system, I can actually use the cards that Foundry provides, uh, the API that Foundry provides. Um, so for other systems like Suede, like uh, Twilight 2K has some card involvement as far as I'm aware. There's a whole host of role-playing games out there besides D&D that use cards in a variety of ways. Um, It's a feature that, as one of our moderators often put it, can you call it a virtual tabletop if all aspects of a tabletop are not represented? So if you can roll dice on it, sure. But why can't you use cards as well? Cards should be one of the key features of the software. Um, so that's that's something that uh, definitely contributed to the motivation for card support. That plus the Patreon vote we got it 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 won by I think six percent over the next highest. Uh, very well voted for feature. Um, 
Huh, that's funny. I, I just mentioned Chronicles of Amber from uh, Roger Zelazny to Andrew just yesterday. Uh, hey out there, uh, Ed Hel Heldio? Hel Heldillo? Um, yeah, so apparently the Nine Princes of Amber uh, role-playing game also is diceless. I will idly say, as someone who's played in that work in progress system, uh, you know, once you get past like, oh, it's you know, it's not deep, it's not you're not rolling a dice to play it. It's different. Um, the fact that you be, be like, oh, I have, you know, I I really want to succeed at this. You know, I'm going to use my best card, or I'm not too invested in the success of this. I'm going to play one of my worst cards. You get a level of agency while still not just giving you know free reign to do what you want um and i i i like it as a design the concept um you know because the worst thing is probably rolling a nat one on like your pivotal story role you know and it's just failing um now people are wondering is it possible yeah, to find out was... more about farago and try it out um, not at this time. I've been very close to the, to, to the vest about it. I'm tentatively, ten, I said it last year that I was hoping to actually kickstart it and release it this year. A whole bunch of things have delayed that. Um, but it's, it's official release is coming probably within the next year. Um, the ballpark pitch is it's intended to be a simple fantasy focused role playing game, uh, which uses cards for resolution instead of dice. One of the reasons that cards was the focus in instead of dice is to give that agency that Cody just pointed out where you can in you can trust that your character who you have set up to be good at a thing will consistently be good at that thing and not have to curse the fate of rolling a d20 and getting that consistent roll of less than five for seven straight rolls. Um, it's the whole idea was to make an, a role playing game that someone could uh, someone could use as kind of an introductory first game for people, uh, because a lot of the more complex rule sets like Pathfinder, like Dungeons and Dragons, like really any of the the rules heavy games, aren't that approachable for new people. Now you said it was fantasy focused, but so there's know, my main play of it was a modern setting of oh, um, how would you describe it? Even like it certainly wasn't fantasy. Yeah, that. Yeah, it was. It was a modern horror game, and uh, it was mostly to test that the card system does in fact transfer between uh, particular genres. I think it worked pretty well. I think I would have liked to have carried that on more. Timing kind of ruined that. Maybe we'll return to it before too long. Uh, but I think I think it does work. The initial release is definitely going to be fantasy focused. I'm going to try and hook into those people who were frustrated with D20, uh, who want something a little bit different, but don't want to step too far outside of the fantasy genre. Uh, so I'm I'm aiming for that uh, that kind of people who want to play a fantasy game but don't want to be bogged down too much by rules. Kind of somewhere between Dungeon World and D and D. But even outside whole systems based on actual playing cards, um, you know, there are some good reasons that card support can help bring features to your current games. For instance, in 13th Age, there is a resource you can acquire. Um, you earn these points that can be associated with various factions, and we have plans to represent that as a card the player holds. 
you know, they have a resource point, the player sees that they have it and they spend it by turning in the card. That's not how it's written in real life. In real life, you would, you know, use little tokens or other things, but the, as a feature, the card support for Foundry will, you know, help represent something the player has that's, you know, not for, you know, doesn't have to be on their character sheet. Um... So, you know, there's going to, you're going to see a lot of cool things come out of the feature that don't necessarily mean a standard poker deck. I, um, I do have to really briefly, uh, just chime in on a question in the, uh, in the chat from J-Rock. Um... I'm not sure what you mean by Dune at 100%. There is a Dune 2D20 system available for Foundry BTT. And I think there are some plans uh, in the works from Modiphius about that. Um, as to, you know, what, what exactly you mean by 100%. Uh, as with everything, Foundry Virtual Tabletop... Uh, game systems are limited by the licensing rights of the publisher. If the publisher hasn't released content for it yet, it's stuff that can't be used. So it's obviously not going to be distributed. Um, uh, Ed asks which systems are rules light and role play heavy. If you're gravitating towards something like that, there's a whole bunch of... Uh, powered by the apocalypse systems and stuff like that dungeon world and and those types uh available pretty neat systems i think scum and villainy has a pretty solid implementation and, there's fate um, oh yeah, yeah yeah the fate system as well is supposed to be reasonably rules light uh there's a whole bunch feel free to jump into our community discord and ask around. Uh, I know there's a lot of people working on a lot of game systems. We only have channels for ones that literally drown out the, uh, the other rooms for how popular they are. Uh, but yeah, jump into discord, ask around people can make recommendations. I'm sure. And luckily for all those rule light systems, if there isn't a system implementation, you can always use simple world building or sandbox, um, plug in the care, the attributes you need to keep track of and play the game there. There's not, you know, that's what those are meant for. Um, yeah, the more co uh, complex official, well, not official, the more complex, like full systems are, tend to be like, I'm trying to automate and capture a more complex rule set. And so, you know, that's a lot, you know, a lot of them. Yeah, one thing, one thing that often comes up with regard to game system implementations with Foundry virtual tabletop or really any virtual tabletop, I'm sure is the level of automation that the system provides. Like, I don't know about you guys, I'm I'm a fairly low automation guy. I much prefer if I'm going to deal with running my game, I want the players involved and engaged, and automation sometimes takes them away from that. I so want my system instead to... Instead of me making the calls... Go ahead. In, so in cases where, you know, you have automation going on, I find it often takes the players out of it. It removes that, uh, I don't know, agency almost, where the players are too busy trying to make sure that the automation is correct instead of just doing the thing and getting on with the role playing. my systems to, as someone mentioned, do the math for me. I want it when I roll, you know, a standard attack or a strength check to output a number that's my final, you know, thing that I need. Um, but that's, outside of that, like, it doesn't need to automatically apply damage for me. It doesn't need to automatically apply status effects. Like, those are all bonuses in my mind, you know. If, if I can quickly roll 
and then keep playing the game and focus on playing the game instead of looking up the rules and doing math. You know, that's the fun part is playing it and role playing and, you know, uh, doing the fights. Um, so th that's at least my personal take on it. I also say this recognizing that I've been in process of adding automation support for a number of features in my own game system. Even though I don't want to look at it as automation, I definitely am. Now we're hitting uh, the end of this. Um, what is, we've been enjoying the dulcet tones of Ivan Dutch uh, throughout the stream. Um, that's not our only content creators. Uh, we've had a number of Kickstarters and premium releases. Nath, do you want to tell us, uh, us about some of them? Wow, it's, I don't know, it's been a while and we've had a lot of content released in the last month or so. Um, I know the most recent one was definitely the uh, Earth Dawn 4th Edition, uh, K-Stores or Questers, if you prefer, um, from uh, Faza, thanks to Fat Tom. Um, we I know there's... Bestiary for Sway from the um, Sigil team. We had the Amazing Encounters in Places um, Freed World and Kickstarter from the Worldsmiths team. Um, always great to see, you know, conversion teams that work to bring some cool content. Uh, yeah, there's also the Bloody Blueprints and uh, Macabre Maps uh, Kickstarter from Oh, I can I can never remember their name. It's um uh Deep Dark Designs. Yes. Uh I know there was one from Dragon Shorn in the last month, uh Dead Mines. We have the Earth Dawn system. Wow, there's just Uh, there was something from, yeah, something with Earth Dawn from uh, Ulysses in German. Uh, there's that Atlas, um, the Atlas project from Moonlight Maps. I don't know, man. It's been a heck of a month for content. We've just been dumping steadily for oh, we got the days of Carter. just straight uh... content after content releases. I actually heard about Relic before I like before I even knew that like it was coming to Foundry. I'm like, oh boy, a Shadow of the Colossus tabletop RPG. This sounds pretty cool. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's coming to Foundry. It's like, wait, we announced this. I should know this. But it, it looks like a really cool project. My my only chagrin with it is that it's not coming out for quite some time. Oh yeah, yeah, and. Um... I just remembered the, uh, for those of you out there who are Coriolis fans, uh, Free League actually released the Coriolis rulebook, uh, I think almost a month ago to the day. Uh, so for those of you who are just have been chomping at the bit for Coriolis content, it's, it's out now. You can get it. Um... um there have been hints that we're going to have to be scrolling through this. It's coming there. There is a sale forthcoming. I'm not sure when it's going to start sometime before the end of the month. Uh, so if you want to buy extra licenses or have been waiting, sitting on the fence, looking for a license, uh, but don't want to jump at the uh, $50 price point, uh, there is a sale coming up sometime soon foundry does make a wonderful thanksgiving gift i've been told thanksgiving was a month ago what are you american or something apparently 
I think that is all of our questions. I think I'm sure I'm sure we're missing. I'm sure we're missing so many premium content publishers. Um, if you want to see the full list of everything we've been releasing or others have been releasing for Foundry, the Discord and the content announcements channel is the best way to keep up on that. Frankly, it's too much for us to keep remember at this point. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, there used to be a time where we could actually run through them all in one quick fire session at the end of one of these. And it's just there are so many people releasing so much content, so much awesome stuff out there now. Trying to stay on top of it is just not possible. I'll take this time to thank everyone for coming out. I think we're going to wind down a little bit early. Uh, it's been a heck of a time. Uh, it was great talking to Kaora. Please, if you have uh, any questions or any uh, any follow-up stuff you want to run, our community Discord's always active. We've got a great crew of volunteer helpers and moderators who just... I, I'm in awe of how often they just weigh in with exactly the right answer at exactly the right time. So please jump into Discord, join the community, become one with us. We accept you. Thanks again for coming, everyone. 